Yes, Mid Wales was crucial for me, I think. And in particular because I lived with my grandmother. Um, and I, I think she probably saved me so that I, I didn't become a criminal or uh, mad or anything like that. Um, I actually lived with her when I was a baby. Uh, when I was two weeks old, I was flown over to her uh, and I lived with her until I was two and a half. And then I was brought back to Paris and then back to her uh, to live with her from the age of seven to 13. She was uh, Irish, Welsh and Asian. So she was from the mountains in Pakistan, which was then India. And uh, she, she was the illeg illegitimate child of, um, really the love child of her father. And she was taken in by the family. Uh, she had second sight and she was known as the local witch. So she was an extraordinary character. She had a huge garden and the house, which was very primitive, we didn't have running water, we didn't have toilets, all that kind of thing. Um, it was a council house, uh, but we had a massive garden and we grew almost everything that we ate in her garden. Um, and she had lots of animals. So I think, I think that that garden was my world. And uh, because my mother then lived in Paris and Gran didn't really want to look after us, you know, she was kind of forced to. So in return, we gardened for her because this was her abiding passion, this garden, especially her roses. Um, Living with her uh, gave me my love of nature, really, which I think is behind all my work, all my writing whatever the subject, and, and maybe also gave me that element of the supernatural in, in my work, that I had to believe in that because it was there. She really did have second sight. She knew when someone was about to die, and she would see their ghosts, and she would tell me all this in great detail. And she used to dress up as a gypsy and tell fortunes at fairs, uh, so nice to go with her. Um, yes, I call myself French Welsh. In fact, I'm a French national. I don't have British nationality. Um, I live in London, but I was brought up in Paris and Wales, South and Mid Wales. Um, I think I I emphasise the the Welsh because Wales seems a bit of an outsider place to. England. So that's why I placed myself as an outsider. It, it is an uncomfortable place for me to be. For example, when I go to Paris, I don't, although I feel French, I'm treated as an English person there because I don't speak fluent French. So I'm, I'm outside my own roots, as it were. You know, to actually think that I might be French and I might be Welsh is great for me. It's good to have uncertain roots rather than no roots. Yes, um, I think Welsh poetry is, is much more confident than it was when I started editing the magazine um, Poetry London. Uh, one of the people that I published a lot was Robert Minhinnick and I, I think that he did a lot to broaden Welsh poetry uh, because of his travels. Uh, he, he actually emphasised the local, Port Cole, and um, Iraq, America, uh, everywhere that he travelled. I think that that showed the way for a lot of other poets. I, I do think that Welsh poetry is marginalised. I Living in London, I'm aware that a lot of people, a lot of poets have never heard of Seren, for example, uh, Gomer, uh, Parthian, they, they haven't heard of these presses, and um, yes, yeah, so I, I think there is a tendency, and maybe it's the other way as well, that um, some Welsh poets uh, confine themselves to Wales and to a Welsh readership, uh, instead of looking outwards. I try to write for an international readership. Um, I, uh, I, I've had 
my poems, books um, translated in, in Mexico and Serbia, and uh, in, in China there's a select of poems coming out. I, I would hope that what I write about and how I write would transmit into those very different cultures. So, um, <clears throat> I do, I mean, I, I, I have a fascination with the planet as a whole and various wilderness areas in, in the planet. And so, <clears throat> I, I yes, I'm not interested in just confining myself to a British readership. I've, I have an editor in Amy Wack who is, she's totally independent from the mainstream British scene, really. First of all, she's a Californian. And then she's a woman, <laughs> and, and the other thing is that she has a lot of integrity. She really does, she just kind of thinks about what she likes. I don't think she thinks about what's fashionable or, um, you know, what's going to go down well. This does give me free reign to pursue my single-minded vision, so I don't have to compromise, which I can't. So I can't compromise, so it's great that I've, I've got that freedom. It, uh, it, it is, I think, very hard to write uh, painful personal subjects in, um, in poems. It seems to be taboo. And I don't feel that I have a choice in doing that. That's what I need to write. Uh, but I, I don't think that... I don't think that my work is just about autobiography. What I'm really interested in is uh, uh, investigation and exploration of whether people are evil or good. Yeah. You know, I've, I've had this experience of two very difficult parents and abusive in different ways, and this gives me intense material, uh, first-hand material that I can explore through. Uh, I've also travelled in the Venezuelan Amazon and I, I found that um, researching uh, the various peoples that live there, uh, some of them are considered evil, such as the Yanomami, a very violent people. Um, so I, I, I like to draw the parallel and to um, see the my parents as almost to kind of take them into that rainforest place uh, where I can isolate them from the everyday world and um, try to see what it is about them that's good and what's bad and why um, and to try to make them somehow beautiful because um, the Amazonian peoples and the Amazon itself is very beautiful as well as a, um, it's also a green hell because you, know, you get bitten um, by mosquitoes and snakes and scorpions um, and it's uh, all the humid heat and the rains and everything. But um, the people have an extraordinary mythology and extraordinary kind of uh, traditions and a lifestyle that's pretty much in harmony with nature. So putting my parents in that kind of context, for me, isolates them from the everyday um, humdrum existence of, say, South Wales or in Paris, and um, gives them a new light. Yes, I, I do feel an outsider to the British scene. And... Um, I was an outsider when I was when I was a visual artist as well, so it's nothing new to me. Uh, it seems to be the way that I do things, and uh, it can't be helped. So I, yeah, so I I do have a certain amount of fun uh, being that. Um, of course, it means that I'm not uh, in fashion, or I, I'm, I don't fall into maybe the boxes that are there for people, but. Um, but hey, I think that poets should be setting fashions and uh, changing, changing poetry. 
I found my voice very painfully and slowly. At first I was a sculptor at the same time, so whenever it was diff too difficult for me to write, I would turn to sculpture. And so I didn't progress. It was only when I gave up sculpture that I started to go through the difficulties. And around that time, I travelled to the Amazon. And I think that that's where I found the kind of things that I was interested in, which was um, the raw, nature in the raw, the primitive, and um, that kind of intensity of life. And that's, I think, from then on, I tried to make my poems more direct and vibrant. I think that I worked towards making each poem as if it was an object or an installation that I could walk into or um, a sculpture. So as physical, as physically real, however spiritual the aim was in the poem. Sharon Olds, I, I have a vivid memory of the first time I saw the father, her book, The Father, and it was lying on a table in a pub. And there were some people there, not poets, who said, looked at the book and said, oh, what's that? Oh, poetry. Oh. And then said, oh, hold on. It's called The Father. Oh, that looks interesting. And um, I, that made me aware that you could really write very directly about parents and that it might matter to people generally and not just be about poets writing for poets, um, but also just the way that she does, just write so, so directly about her, her family, really. Uh, it, it did kind of give me a kind of permission to uh, try that myself. Frida Kahlo, um, she, she was there in the background when I, was a, when I was an art student. Of course, we weren't taught her because we were only taught uh, male artists. Uh, but a, a tutor came into my uh, st uh, studio when I was at the Royal College and said, the way that you, you lay out your studio reminds me of the Blue House. You must go and see it. and You, you must look at her work more closely. I didn't for many years, but... When I did, which was about the time that I was finishing The Zoo Father, I suddenly realised that I could, uh, would be able to write about certain subjects that are very hard to write about as yourself. So I could write as her, because she had such an absolutely fascinating, colourful life, but also extremely painful. Um, so I loved that juxtaposition of the vibrant, colourful and the... Um, trauma, the terrible bus crash that she suffered and all the um, surgeries that she had to have as a consequence um, uh, and the, the fact that she made art out of it so there seemed to be something that I could identify with very very easily um, uh, and that's what I did and it was great fun to do that uh, and in fact in a way to write uh, and be more myself, but at the same time not myself. And my ma manifesto changes as I go along, but at the moment it's, um, I have a title for my next collection, which is Fovery. Now Fovery is a big cat house in, in the zoo, and uh, I have a total obsession about the fauvery in the Jardin des Plantes, in the menagerie there. Uh, and when I stay in Paris, I go there almost every day to have a look at the big cats, the jaguar and um, uh, crowded leopards and uh, the snow leopards, uh, them all. And um, the word fauvery also has the word fauve in it. So the painters, the fauve, the wild beasts, who use colour straight from the tube, raw colour, 
and uh, who uh, shocked the current um, scene for, for um, painting. So I think at the moment the idea of uh, the wild beast poet, <laughs> poetry, poetry that looks at the primitive but at the spiritual at the same time, uh, because I do think of animals, when I look at a jaguar, uh, I think of it in the Amazon itself, and as I think of it as the spirit of the Amazon, as the people who live there did do. Uh, so, you know, I think all the connotations of the word fovery might be a manifesto for me. The, the collection fovery is a kind of follow-up uh, to the zoo father, except that it's now 13 or 14 years on from when I was writing The Zoo Father. So it's a long time since my father died. I'm not as angry as I was when I wrote that book. Um, so maybe I can, I'm approaching the material with different tones and uh, more compassion, hopefully, uh, but still uh, unflinching. So this collection is more set in Paris than in the Amazon, although uh, Amazonian creatures do come into it. Uh, it. It focuses on my father and on my father as Paris. And when I used to visit my father in Paris, I realised that I loved, I fell in love with the city, the city where I was born, in fact, and where I was when I was a little child and had an absolutely miserable time. So it, it is extraordinary, this passage of time between you know, going to places where I, where I went to school and where I lived as a child and was deeply unhappy and being there now and loving it, absolutely loving Paris. So I hope that some of that joy comes across in this, in this book as well as some of the pain.